In this episode, we'll be talking about the influence of AI on service design. We'll talk about the need for new business models and we'll talk about using anthropology to create impact even if there is not enough time to do research. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Emma and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is Emma Eigen Clark. The reason I'm so excited to have Emma on the show is because she's a super experienced professional who brings the anthropology lens to service design. So as I mentioned in the opening, we'll cover a lot of different topics ranging from AI, business models to anthropology. And after watching this episode, you'll have a better understanding of the three undercurrent trends that are now profoundly shaping service design. So hope you're ready because we're going to jump straight into the chat with Emma. Welcome to the show, Emma. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And not a guest from uh, Canada, Toronto. Uh, <laughs> we've had quite a few. How, how is that that so many service and design oriented people are coming from Canada these days, Emma? I would have to say that Toronto seems to be um, a burgeoning hotbed of professionalization in this hmm. space. Yeah. A any, any clues to what has caused that? Was there an inflection point? Honestly, I think it's just one of those constellation of factors. I think Idea Couture, uh, places like Bridgeable, The Moment, um, Mars. I don't know if you know about Mars, which is our um, innovation hub. Sidewalk Labs has set up, uh, Google Alphabet has set up a smart city prototype here. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess just a bunch of things came together and there, there seems to be a real confluence and, you know, it's great. It's hmm. great. <clears throat> I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. And then recently the service design conference, which was held in Toronto, probably also uh, helped a little bit. Emma, um, you said something about idea culture and we've had not just someone, we had the man from idea culture, Idris Moody. Yeah on the show. What is your, for the people who don't know who you are, could you give like a super brief introduction? Sure. Uh, my name is Emma Aiken Clark. Um, I am the chief anthropologist and SVP of human insights at Idea Couture, uh, which is now a cognizant interactive company. Awesome. Um, yeah. Well, and for people who want to know more, just check your LinkedIn profile, probably, or Google you. <laughs> yeah, and we'll make sure to add all the relevant links down below. This, um, I, I'm, I haven't prepared you for this question, so I'm curious if, uh, if you have an answer to this one. But do you remember the very first time you got in touch with service design? Uh, the very first time I sort of discovered service design was probably... Uh, you mean as a discipline or as a word as, as a term as a yeah um epic so it was in 2007 at the ethnographic praxis and industry conference uh it was held in chicago that year and this was after i had completed my dissertation had my first child at the same time um, realized that academic career was probably not the route I wanted to take, went to this conference called Epic. There was um, a collection of amazing ethnographers and service designers there, and it was a rapid immersion into the field. <clears throat> 2007, that's the year when I sort of started, 2006, 2007. So you were early on the ride. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I learned about it on the job, to be honest with you. Hmm. Um, it was the sort of thing where we would sell something that we would understand our client to need. Maybe we hadn't done it exactly that way before. And uh, there was a lot of learning by doing and partnering and collaborating with amazing clients to do some really great service design work. I think, I think that's how we roll, learning yeah. on the job. Uh, otherwise, it gets boring pretty quickly. Emma, um, we're going to talk about, we're going to add some 
uh, eth ethnography, anthropology, like those are probably the most hardest words to pronounce uh, <laughs> when, when you have a sore throat. Um, we're going to add that in this episode, um, but we're going to start off with a topic um, which might sound a little bit strange to people who have just heard your background, but let's do yep. it anyway. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. I'm ready. So what could this be? What could the strange topic be? It is the topic of AI. AI, yes. And yes. do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? You, you yes. have like the original, original. Can you show them up? Yeah. Can you see it? Okay, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Okay, shall I, shall I launch a question? Please do. Okay, so, um, you know, spending some time thinking about the ways that service design and AI are intersecting. Um, how can we use AI to innovate services and experience design um, in ways that are ethical, inclusive, and humanizing? You're setting the bar pretty high. <laughs> I don't, I didn't say I knew the answer. Hmm. I just know that I'd like to ask the question. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so what are some of the, um, let, let's start by uh, understanding your notion of AI. Like what do you foresee in the relationship between AI and services? Some initial yeah. ideas? Yeah. So when I think of what we do in the service design space, um, you know, we think about, let's say, um, the journey that a human goes through whether they're a customer or a patient um, or, or a user of a tool in a system. Um, and we think through the touch points and we like to be able to anticipate whatever, whatever ex experience will um, be encompassed in, in any given touch point, right? Um, I think that AI is in some spaces already being used in this way, but to gather data and then be able to make decisions about the kind of experience that are released at any given touch point or between touch points. So I was, you know, reading online different ways that this is so being, um, you know, imagined. So uh, think through. You're a patient and you're, you're um, waiting, you're, you've seen um, a general practitioner and you need to be, um, you need to go see a specialist. Um, imagine if there was some sort of AI through your patient journey that might be, um, you might be taking log of your symptoms and it might be able to prompt different things for you to do in order to get to the right uh, specialist or between appointments, ways to care for yourself based on the kinds of um, daily logs you might have. Mm, I, I'm just, mm -hmm. that's a bad example that I just made up off the top of my head, right? Yeah, okay. So it, essentially, I think what I'm talking about is a way for um, decisions to be made around the kinds of prompts and touch points um, we're providing people from a service and experience perspective that are fed by algorithmic interpretation of people's you know data right mm -hmm. which i think on one hand is an amazing way to think about um enriching a service experience personalizing a service experience in ways that an individual doesn't need to personalize themselves no one mm. wants to go in and fill out a series of things in order to pattern their the the the, the journey for themselves but to be able to provide that um, highly personalized set of touch points through through that kind of decision making would be amazing but on the flip side we know that there are a lot of ethical issues involved with the way that um, AI and machine learning gather data. Um, I guess the kind of bias that goes in, it's what you put in and what you put out is what you put out. So what is your biggest concern regarding the ethical implications? I guess I'm on my first instinct, my reactive concern is, is this inclusive? or is it discriminatory? Who, where, what kinds of people are able to produce the data 
um, in order to release this kind of um, powerful decision making and service experience for themselves. And who's left out of this? Right, right. right. Um, so who doesn't have access to the kinds of technologies or who just doesn't use these systems in the way that they need to be used to mm. produce data that would be mm. able to unleash these kinds of um, real time service design experiences. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It, yeah, yeah. We're going to get a group of, uh, I don't know how to call them, but the advanced service consumers and like the traditional service consumers that don't get the benefits of, well, if there are benefits uh, of, of AI augmented experiences, yeah. sort yeah. of, right? Yeah, I think, mm. yeah, it's just thinking about, you know, does everyone use the right systems and the right tools in the right ways to be able to participate in these kinds of service experiences? And if we're raising the bar, when you think about things like health and wellness, when you think about financial wellness, when you think of all the the places and industries where um, service design is applied. And if you start creating a series of um, data driven, AI driven experiences, if you're not participating in that, or if you're not able to use these tools in if you're differently abled, or right. if you are, you know, restricted in any way, then you are no there, there's a whole world of experiences that you're now cut off from. Um, and you can no longer access. That's hmm. just the first thing sure. comes to mind. I'm sure there's many more, but that's sort of the one that stuck with me first. <clears throat> In um, public sector uh, environments, I, I'm sure that there are policies who that would sort of safeguard this, that would be a safety net. Um, I hope so. let, let's hope so. Yeah. I, in commercial settings, this would be a bit different, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, you can imagine a world where you know, when you have an iPhone, you're able to participate in a platform that enables these kinds of outcomes. But you know, what if you don't have an iPhone? Right. What if you don't have a smartphone? What if your digital literacy or digital participation is quite low for a, you know, a multitude of reasons, you know, one would hope municipally yeah. that you know, you would, uh, there would be governmental safeguards about this kind of thing. But you also know that municipalities are racing to become completely digitized. Mm. And um, one one would hope that that tension is is at the forefront of design in this space. So what does this mean for us as service designers? Should we ignore new technologies as AI? No, no I think that we need to broaden. So I don't, okay, I would question how might we broaden um, the the canvas in which we apply our capabilities as service designers. So what is what does service design need to be and do to um, first of all, make sure that the data and the algorithms that we're creating are robust and receiving information from the most uh, broadest group possible, but also let's think through um, exactly on this problem, right? So I think that as service designers, we are quite um, adept at solving exactly these kinds of problem statements hmm. and just heading, making that um, an area of focus specifically. I, I wouldn't shy away from the technology, but I would take it as a really interesting, productive and creative challenge um, how do we ensure that in a world where AI is being used to deliver these kinds of service experiences, um, you know, let's challenge ourselves to make it as inclusive and non-discriminatory as possible. <clears throat> Final question regarding AI. Um, like, is, it, uh, is there a fundamental difference with other technologies like in any uh, piece of technology that you introduce in a, as, a, as a service provider, like you, you're always throwing up a barrier or potentially uh, throwing up a barrier. It, like, is there something intrinsic to AI from your perspective that makes it different? Yeah, and I, I, I do. I think, I guess I want, I, that's a good question. And I wonder 
in the ways that when you start having this system and this tool be able to make decisions mm -hmm. without intervention okay that, that feels instinctually different yeah. to me yeah um and you know there's that whole black box issue yeah. around yeah transparency uh, right yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah that feels different to me hmm all right um this it's is definitely it's a good question because maybe it's not all that different and maybe we're fetishizing the difference so as we ponder this i think it would be worthwhile to look to places like inclusive and universal design to see best practices in how um those kinds of concerns have already been mitigated um so that maybe we're not fetishizing the the technology itself so yeah. I think you raised <clears throat> the I, I, i'm guessing that uh, a lot of um again uh, public service organizations who have moved a big chunk of their services to the digital space, to the online space, have had to dealt with similar questions. For sure. I use it, and the last thing I'll say on this is that the the issue of, about data privacy and security, I think, is is pretty um, prominent in ways that maybe other technological interventions are not. A topic definitely worth exploring more yeah. in the coming years on the show but let's uh, right. let's keep it at this and move on to topic number two which is the topic of business model business models yes which question starter goes along with this one what if hmm okay so my question comes from the context of um the professional service delivery of service design. So um, I, I am a consultant and we do service design for clients. My question is, what if clients um, slowly stop wanting to buy service design and instead want to do it themselves? Which is, is which is happening. Yes. I'm seeing, as I'm sure you are, um, definitely a, a trend, if you will, in that direction that um, our clients are less and less interested in the one or two off project. Definitely seeing at first it was a desire for um, a learning by doing project where we might do a piece of service design for them and then wrap a capability building training template making um, project around that. Um, more and more, we're seeing that our clients are embedding and creating their own service design um, capabilities in house. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and I think that you know the first reaction might be to be overly concerned about that, but we've played around with um, different commercial models, and I actually think it's an amazing opportunity. Um, for the clients that we have that do have internal service design teams, mm -hmm. some of the most rewarding work that we have the opportunity to participate in. When your client isn't someone that you need to, there's nothing wrong with having to teach a client while you're doing something, but when that area of focus can go away and you can truly learn from each other um, as, as craftspeople, um, that's been a wonderful experience. Um, we do a lot of work in Canada, actually, with TELUS. Um, oh, yes. Uh, yes. Judy. Judy. Yes. Yeah, Judy. So it's such a pleasure working with Judy and her team. Um, they are sophisticated practitioners of this craft. And so when we come together, we learn from each other. And we don't have to spend all that time um, teaching them why we're doing what we're doing. Right, it right. just, you can just get into a rhythm and go and it's great. So that's the one piece that I think is wonderful about our clients having internal service design projects. And in that sense, when we're working in a, in a model like that, we're just doing um, work that they don't have the capacity to do themselves. But there's another thing that we've been playing around with, which is more like an embedded pod model. Um, so um, rather than um, having, you know, a defined SOW against a, a statement of work or a contract against a particular business challenge in that mm -hmm. sense, um, that 
sort of a fixed fixed bid model. We're, we're working in a specific problem. We have to define the work ahead of time. We have to say, we have to scope the work. We have to say, it's going to take this many people, this many hours. These are the activities we're going to do. These are the outcomes that they're going to be. And this is how long it's going to take us. Um, the tough thing about that, as I'm sure you, you've experienced, is it doesn't allow you to really react and be nimble as you unpack the problem and perhaps reframe it, sometimes the things you need to do are different than the things you thought you had to do before you were immersed. Um, often the amount of time it would take to renegotiate that contract to do what you need to do, it's not even worth it. So mm -hmm. you, make, you pivot to the degree that you can within the scope that has been agreed to. And that's how we worked for the better part of a decade. What we're seeing when we embed a pod of capability in with a client, it's more like a retainer model. Um, and we might say you can have a service designer, um, an anthropologist, and maybe a foresight strategist. And you know these people will embed in your service design team or your design team, what have you, for um, X amount of time. We get to truly play the role of a service designer. Sure. Yep. Yeah, we get to respond, react, change what we're doing, and not have to worry about that predefined scope. Um, I find that it's a much more authentic articulation of what we're meant to be doing as service designers when we're sort of freed from the the, the constraints of that SOW um, in in that kind of pod model. I'm <clears throat> I'm seeing something similar happening very close by uh so but my my biggest question regarding this what what kind of client does this take like what this this isn't suited for every organization or every client no. like what are the characteristics of these clients that actually have the confidence to embark on this type of model so it's a it's a client that with a more mature internal design capability. Hmm. That's who it is. Um, it's the client that has gone through their phase of buying this to developing it as an internal capability um, to having design embedded in their own processes, right? that um, they now realize the benefit of, you know, it, it's in a way, it's staff of, in a way. Hmm. It's like staff augmentation, sure. right? Yeah. And, and, but it's, it's, you can look at it in that way, which has some negative connotations sometimes. I look at it as we just get to embed and truly partner with the client. So I guess the things that need to be true are a mature and established internal design or innovation capability is where this is best suited. And what? how would you describe the value that you're adding then as an external body to the team? Like why Why isn't, Why isn't? aren't they embedding these skills as well? Why do they still yeah. want to partner with an external consultancy? I think they do have internal skills as mm -hmm. well, but often it's just a capacity issue. Okay. So they may realize that across their own portfolio, in cross of their own new product development or new service development process, whether it's, you know, we're, we're doing this work in um, an insurance space right now, we're doing this work in a pharma space right now, where um, they just don't have the capacity, right? And so they don't have enough people to address the need that they're seeing from the rest of their business. So by bringing in external, they don't have to hire internal and, and have that, you know, it's a temporary need that they may have. Mm. We bring with us new, slightly new ways of doing sure. things. So that yeah. they may have a service design capacity, but they may not have strategic foresight as part of sure. that. So you know, we might bring in something a little bit different. It's still a learning opportunity for their teams because we're not, you know, we're typically, you know, working collaboratively with some folks there. Um, they get to learn from us, and we get to learn from them sure. as well. Yeah. <clears throat> um. How 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 big is the uh, shift in business model from a consulting perspective? Like, is it hard? How, yeah, I don't know. What what are the biggest challenges in making this transition towards this model? Um, except for finding the clients, I guess. Yeah, it's about finding the clients, 
And it's just about being comfortable with the ambiguity mm-hmm. of um, not having a predefined scope of work. Hmm. So what we can say is we're going to predefine the capability that we're giving you. And we can talk about the activities and outputs that each capability knows how to produce. Right. So you can mm-hmm. safe yourself that way. So you can say like, these are the typical um, research activities and these are the typical research outcomes so that whoever you're putting in there isn't going to suddenly be asked to do something that they're completely unfamiliar with. So you can have those kind of agreements, but you just have to be comfortable with the ambiguity of not knowing what problem you're solving until you get there. But in a way, that's great. We spend months God, sometimes years going back and forth with a client trying to define a scope of work and sure. the problem changes and changes. And then finally you sign it. And then it changes when, again. <laughs> yeah. When you do it this way, all of that problem framing that you're doing pre-contract is now paid for. Hmm, right? Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. 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 And, and it's great. I think the one thing when you think about um, from a talent perspective, um, Sometimes these projects may end up being longer because they're not actually projects, right? So while the benefit for someone who's in a pod might be a really amazing kind of collaborative relationship with a client um, where you truly get to understand the business that you're you're participating in, sure. that's an amazing yep. opportunity. Yep. Flip side is you might get bored yep. because... Whereas before you were coming off and on at say three, four, five months, you know what I mean? You may be somewhere a little bit longer and you would lose that nice variation. So <laughs> so it all also requires um, a certain type of service designers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious uh, and want to challenge people who are listening and watching this. Leave a comment if you see a similar pattern. I. I do, like I said, very closely. So um, this is definitely a shift that is happening. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think a lot of opportunity in it, though. Are you ready to move on to the third and final topic, Emma? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, because me... we're on the home turf for you right now with the topic of anthropology. Yes. Yes. Um, let me look here. Hold on. You are how far? Okay. Yes. How far? How far? How far up and down or across the innovation or design arc does anthropology span? And um, what are the, how did the impacts change depending on, on where anthropology comes <coughs> Sorry, uh, still uh, a little bit uh, cold, but um, I'm trying to grasp uh, this. Like, what do you see when you say uh, anthropology within the innovation arc? What what okay. what is what is the mental picture that you see? Yeah, the mental model. So, any sort of service design or innovation general arc. Um, you have your discovery phase, your exploration phase, you've got your design, you've got your build, you've got your implementation, just general, right? Usually there's some form of iteration sure. in yeah. there. Um, for a long time, so we do we do anthropology in, in service design. We do sort of a design anthropology where... Um, we are using ethnographic methods to explore the broader contexts that shape any particular experience with product or service. And we believe that, and what we've seen is that by understanding these broader contexts, um, we're able to often reframe our understanding of the challenge in the first place um, and provide much more relevant um, experiences for the people that we're designing yeah. for. Um, when we started this work, you know, it's been around 11 years for me in this space, we were doing much more of the exploratory discovery phase to help define the problem mm-hmm. before the thing was even conceptualized, mm-hmm. before there was even a thing to think about, right? 
So we know that if, if um, anthropology or design anthropology comes in at that phase, it's really about problem framing using a broader context and understanding of the broader context of human experience. Okay. Yep. Um, but, you know, this might be a product of, you know, um, how we work now within the context of Cognizant, which is a, a technology organization. But we had already started to see this with our clients prior to our acquisition, that there's more of a need and more of a push for um, faster projects, faster outcomes. I don't know if you're seeing the same thing, but less appetite for longer work and often more of a desire to start with the prototype um, where it's like, here's the thing. Right. Let's go see what we can from a user or patient or human, mm -hmm. whatever it is, perspective. And then let's, what's the MVP? How do we iterate and put it out really quickly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've been able to flex our muscles in that space as well when we're almost doing um, anthropology as UX research, where we're saying, um, okay, we know, we already know that we're going to be releasing um, a, a service or an experience that looks like this, mm -hmm. how might we incorporate that contextual understanding at that point? Um, and then sometimes we're brought in even later, like here's the thing and we're just refining it, right? Um, we're able to, I think, provide a very differentiated set of understandings, but I do question our ability to reframe the problem the further down we go the innovation arc yeah or the, the service design arc um down that process and so in as i see clients wanting less time on these projects and just um you know how just tell us tell us how to fix it how, how to make it better how to optimize it sometimes i i wonder are we diminishing the impact of what we're capable of doing mm. a little bit? <clears throat> Is there is there an alternative if this is what clients are asking for at this moment? If this is what clients are asking for, and then this is the need. And as we know, as service designers, you know, you have to address you have to address the needs. And I think the challenge is to continue to think about um, when I think about what the power of anthropology is in this space, it really is that contextual understanding um, for us when we're brought in after the thing already sure. exists, yeah what kind of research do we need to do to have people um to be able to understand those broader contexts within which the experience is being um you know used and brought to life a lot of times we do that by having people imagine how they're going to use this thing um we might provide uh, an intervention or um, some stimuli to help them imagine what their future use with this thing might be. And then as people are talking through their imaginings of how I might use, the, use this dashboard or how this patient support program, um, you know, might impact my life, we use their imaginings as our field of ethnographic exploration a little bit. Um, so that's sort of how we, we overcome it a bit, which is um, really just ethnographically probe their future imaginings with this thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but I wanted to say that the type of research uh, uh, turns from uh, exploration into validation. Uh, yeah. But but you've sort of with this, there is also a middle ground, like you can still do sort of explored or I don't know how we, how would you describe this type of research where you um, yeah um we talk about them it's not our terminology within the design anthropology discourse and literature I think it's um Joaquin Hulse coined the term ethnographies of the future or ethnographies okay. of the possible okay um, where we are almost at a valid a validation stage but in order to validate we still think we need that broader context of understanding that it's not enough to say is this working is this not it's to push a little further with that ethnographic lens to say 
imagine how this might be used by you. What might a future day in the life look Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. with this thing? And to validate through that broader contextual lens of the future imagination, um, we think is probably the best way to continue to apply that anthropological and ethnographic rigor. And to, and to sort of hope that people will start seeing the value and start questioning if this is the right problem we should be solving in the first place, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Emma, I know, uh, again, a question that you haven't prepared for, but um, is there a question you have for us, the viewers and listeners of the show? Is there anything you'd like us to think about, ponder upon, maybe in relationship to the previous topic? Well. I guess I'd be just, you know, really, I feel like my, my experience as a service design professional is, you know, limited to the little world that I live in and the clients that I serve. Um, I'm just really curious and about how other people are seeing service design evolve as it becomes professionalized, um, as it becomes a discipline. Um, I think what's really interesting at, when you think about what happens when something becomes a discipline, it becomes standardized. Mm-hmm. And yep. you're starting to see a standardization of, of, this, of this discipline as it becomes more professionalized. But design is inherently something that shouldn't be standardized. Well, so, we, can ha- we can do a separate episode on that. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm curious from everyone else's perspective as the discipline evolves and professionalizes and as we become more standardized in our approach, what are we doing as as a body to make sure that, you know, what's powerful about design isn't lost in this process? That's a really important question to ask. Thanks, Emma. Uh, For people (laughs) who... (laughs) who (laughs) I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, for people who are excited about what uh, you just told and want to get in touch with you to further discuss or ask questions, what's the best way to get in touch with you? LinkedIn, I think. Mm-hmm. LinkedIn works. Okay. So yeah. I'll, I'll make sure that all the relevant links are down in the description of this episode. Perfect. Emma, thanks so much for sharing what's on your mind these days, the questions that you have. Um, Yeah, it was it was a pleasure having you on. Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's uh, this was fun to chat through. Thanks so much. Happy to hear that. Thanks, Emma. All right. Thank you. So what is your take on Emma's question? Leave a comment down below and join the conversation. We need comments from people like you. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing sharing it with just one other person today. You'll help to grow the Service Design Show community and help me to invite more inspiring guests like Emma. Thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode over here. See you in that video.